Welcome to the J. Kim Show. This is your host, J. Kim. I am an investor, author, and fitness entrepreneur. And for the first time in Asia, I sit down with the world's most brilliant minds in business, investing, and entrepreneurship. You'll learn all the secrets, strategies, and formulas to becoming a successful entrepreneur directly from the masters. If this is your first time listening, thank you for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week with the goal of providing actionable insight to you, the listener, with every single episode. And now, on to the show. Today's show guest runs one of Hong Kong's hottest fashion retail companies, and his name is Luke Grana, who runs a company by the same name as his last name, Grana. Grana is one of Hong Kong's hottest startups, and it's one that I'm most excited about right now, because last year they raised a $10 million dollar round from Alibaba's entrepreneurship fund. And that was only two years after they started their operations. So Luke's business model is very simple. His team sources the best fabrics from around the world, cuts out the middleman, and also has no retail stores, which leaves him with direct-to-consumer e-commerce fashion that is at a 50% profit margin. Luke started his business in Australia, but quickly moved to Hong Kong due to his strength in logistics, namely the cheap rates he could get on global DHL shipping. Today, I had the pleasure of visiting their beautiful 18,000 square foot warehouse space down in the south side of Hong Kong. Got to meet a bunch of his team and had a nice time hearing about his story as an entrepreneur. I'm a huge fan of the company's style. It's very basic and clean and affordable. And they're able to offer clothes made from fine materials such as Peruvian cotton, Chinese silk, Japanese denim, and Irish linen at very affordable prices. All right, let's get on to the show. Let's get started. So I am sitting here in the Grana warehouse in the south uh, of the island in Hong Kong. And it's a very special treat because usually my show guests, uh, I usually do it over the internet on Skype. So I'm very happy to be sitting here with Luke Grana, who is the founder of Grana.com, uh, one of the rising star stars uh, in my radar here. And, um, you know, I... I it's it's a Hong Kong startup, so I have a soft spot for people that are based here in Hong Kong, being based here uh, myself for 12 years. So, uh, Luke, thank you so much for coming on the show. We're very happy to have you here. For the audience listening in, can you please just introduce yourself? Who is Luke Grana? What do you do for a living? Yeah, well, th thanks for having me on the show. Um, so I'm I'm Luke Grana. Um, I uh, work work at Grana.com. We're, we're a new e-commerce uh, fashion brand. Uh, we're, we're based in Hong Kong. Uh, we've been here for uh, growing for, for the past two and a half years. So we're still developing as a brand. And uh, I'm, I'm the CEO and founder of Grana. Awesome. And so Grana is, is slowly becoming, or not slowly, I guess rapidly becoming more and more of a household name. I'm seeing you guys pop up a, a lot, uh, both online and, and offline, which is nice. So I was actually introduced to you, to your company by... One of your investors, David Chang, I had a dinner with him a couple months ago, and he was actually wearing one of your Grana shirts. And we were talking about the uh, startup ecosystem here in Hong Kong. And uh, he, of course, uh, it, you know, was didn't miss a chance to talk up his portfolio. And and uh, and I liked the shirt he was wearing. And so it 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 brought me to research your company a little bit more. And um, and uh, you know. Luckily, I was able to get in touch with Amanda, and we set this uh, this talk up. So, um, again, thank you for your time. So, why don't let's let's take a step back and let's talk about your past and what led you up to this point. I mean, you're. It seems like you have had several entrepreneurial uh, ventures in the past, so you're somewhat of a serial entrepreneur. Um, tell us about your background growing up and what you studied and what caused you to want to become an entrepreneur and what eventually led you down to to starting Grano. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just you know, quick background. Um, I'm born in Australia. I'm from Sydney. I'm 33 years old now. I just had my birthday a few ah, weeks happy ago. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess always growing up, I always, always loved you know, businesses and, and the idea of starting a business. So I, I always had that as I was growing up. Uh, and I studied a, a Bachelor of Commerce, uh, majoring in marketing at uh, Macquarie University. Mm -hmm. Actually, in my, my last year of university, I, I, I set up my first coffee shop, oh, wow. which was just near the campus, and uh, set that up for for twenty thousand Australian dollars. And within nine months, uh, I was able to sell that for one hundred and ninety thousand. 
Wow. So it's a really good introduction to, to <laughs> business and, and small business. And I think that also, you know, really propelled me as, as you know, always wanting to, to do my own business. That's incredible. So you had your first exit in college. <laughs> yeah. And with a coffee shop. How with, did, with a small coffee shop. How yeah. did you fund that initially? Was it like your own savings? Was it friends and family that helped you? Uh, so while I was at the first couple of years in university, I was, I was working in different coffee shops. Uh, so I actually saved up 20,000 Australian dollars wow. over two years. Uh, and then I invested that into the first uh, first cafe and had a you know pretty good exit and also you know it was very good you know learnings you know to, to how to build a small team right. how to create systems right. create culture um, so so that was you know really good 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 first business and then I actually after university I, I did two more cafes uh, so so in Sydney um, set them up uh, built a small team uh, and then sold them uh, pretty quickly after opening them so that that was the first. You know, introduction to, to business and had some great great success and also great learnings and uh, then from 2008 to 2012 uh, I built a business uh, in Australia New Zealand called ChargePoint okay. uh, and this was very much a left field type of business we installed uh, electric vehicle charging stations so I, I worked on that business for a few years and again built a small team raised a bit of capital but my biggest learning was that uh, market timing Mm. I think uh, when I was talking about electric vehicles, it was still very early day. Right. Um, and uh, we, we were about 10 years ahead of the curve. But again, it was really, really good good lessons for me and mm. also l lessons about you know, managing cash flow and building team. So actually, I, I, I was able to sell ChargePoint to Leighton's, which is quite a big wow. in infrastructure company. Uh, not for, for a great exit, but it was you know, good to, to have that as experience. Sure. And then in b the the beginning of 2013, I was actually looking at uh, industries, looking at um, new business opportunities, and I looked at the the fashion industry and realized that it's uh, it's being disrupted right now, and mm. uh, there's there's very big legacy uh, biz fashion businesses with thousands of retail shops, with local warehouses, with middlemen, and I just thought you know it's, it's time to change that, and uh, with the growth of online. Uh, so actually, the beginning of 2013, I, I did a trip to Peru uh, to visit my brother who was living there, and I, I learned about uh, Peruvian Pima cotton, and I realized that this is a beautiful, luxurious, soft fabric, and this is a great product to, to sell T-shirts. So I started working with some fabric mills in Peru, and at that time, I came back to Australia, and um, I realized that I'm not from the fashion world. I don't mm -hmm. know much about fashion, so I got a job at Zara in Sydney oh, uh, okay. for the first th three months of, of 2013. Uh, 13 and was just on the floor selling, uh, speaking to customers in the changing rooms, learning about price points and styles. Uh, and then actually I got a job for the next three months with French Connection. Oh, so right. a really good, like, you know, on the ground experience learning about uh, fashion. So then I took that experience and, and I built the first version of our, our business plan, which still remains today. And, and our focus is on uh, three pillars. It's on having the world's best fabrics. So really traveling the world to find the best fabrics for our, for our customers. Uh, the second one is just focusing on timeless wardrobe essentials, so focus of fabric and really good fit. And then the third one, which also led me to move to Hong Kong, was just having very low and transparent pricing. So I wanted to create a really lean business model, and uh, I looked at setting up a global distribution center in Sydney, but realized that Sydney, uh, the volume going from Sydney to a global market was, was very low, so the prices were, were very difficult. So then I landed on Hong Kong and realized Hong Kong is, is the best location to set up a, a global distribution center and started talking to, to DHL and realized that the rates that they could provide Grana and the shipping times was actually really, really transformational as, as setting up a business. Right. So Hong, Hong Kong's also a free tax port and also the world's sourcing city, especially right. for fashion. Uh, so at that time, it was mid-2013 and I had 200,000 of, of savings mm -hmm. uh, and got a one-way ticket to Hong Kong. Nice. Um, and uh, set up a small warehouse in, in Kennedy Town. We had uh, f 500 square feet and uh, the first batch of T-shirts arrived. So I had a little, little uh, office. I had uh, 2,000 T-shirts and started working with uh, our now head of technology on the first version of the website. And then in the beginning of uh, April uh, 2014, we actually went through our beta launch. So it took some time to, to get there. But in three weeks, we actually sold out of 2,000 T-shirts. Wow. Uh, and ship them to eight mar eight markets. So that was really our proof point. Right. Um, and up until then, it was just my capital just to, to get us there. And you know, off the back of that, we were able to raise our first um, one million US dollars of, of seed funding. Right. Actually, the first investor was was Bluebell Group. You okay. Know, it's been, sure. been in Hong yep. Kong for a long time. 
Uh, so that was sort of you know a bit of the background and, and how I, I got over to Hong Kong. Wow, that's great! Great story. Thank you for sharing uh, that with our audience. Let's talk a little bit about so for the audience that doesn't understand, w- would you consider grana fast fashion or is it? I guess it's like kind of a a, a sub segment of fast fashion or, or, or a cousin, if you will. How does the supply chain work? Okay, so I mean, you mentioned earlier that you saw a, a need to disrupt or a disruption that was happening right now in that whole chain, right? So let's talk about traditional fashion and how that works versus say fast fashion like a Zara or an H&M or a Uniqlo. And then how does Grana differ from that, from those two models? Yeah, so it's a way that we saw it was that there's a lot of very big fashion brands and they're selling a lot of different products and they have their inventory split all around the world mm. and in shops everywhere. And I think the biggest learning that we we got from investors and also advice is that inventory is 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 a killer to a lot of businesses. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to create a, a business that we had low inventory right. and having one inventory base to, to be able to ship globally. And I think being in Hong Kong allows us to do that. And then we also looked at the product range, whereas like the Zara and H&M, and these other big fashion brands, they sell so many products. Mm-hmm. And it's really about, you know, selling collections and styling right. where we're very much more about the product. And we, we say that Grana, we're item driven. So we're, we're really trying to find items that have a high product market fit right. that, that there's a need for these products mm. rather than saying we're going to sell you every product. Mm-hmm. So, for example, our, our launch products are still some of our best sellers. So we launched with T-shirts. So this is a Privian and Pima cotton t-shirt it's a really beautiful luxury t-shirt but we sell it for 15 dollars, mm-hmm. and that we believe is product market fit right and and up until now it's still one of our best sellers uh, then the next products we launched was our silk shirts and silk tank so for example looking at our silk tank we sell that for 29 us dollars mm-hmm. uh, and that product quality at that price point that's what we also say has product market fit and that's, again, one of our best sellers. Right. Uh, and then we launched a product, uh, the, the cashmere sweater. So it's Mongolian cashmere. Uh, it's beautiful quality. Um, and we sell that for $99. Mm-hmm. And again, it's very hard to find that quality at that price point. So, so this is sort of our philosophy. It's you know, really being more item driven mm-hmm. and finding products that the market really, really wants. Right. And there's a demand at our price point. So, And you're able to bring down the cost of all of that because... Well, first of all, you don't carry heavy inventory um, and you don't have retail stores where you're spending this big overhead, right? Yeah. And then you obviously have found, you've moved to Hong Kong, which is one of the premier locations for logistics. So you've been able to negotiate very low uh, ra- shipping rates with DHL and, and, and whatnot. So traditionally, let's say I'm a Zara, for example, um, and I have a new collection coming out for summer 2017. So how, how does it work? So I, I basically, I have designers, they design it and then they, they go out and they, you have to go source the, you know, can you, can you walk us through that process and then what parts that you cut out to be able to bring that cost all the way down for the end, end product for the consumer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just again, I'm, I'm not from the fashion world, mm-hmm. so I, I don't know how it's been done that in, much in, in the past, sure. but, but what I've been told that, you know, some brands, it takes them you know, nine months to replenish and nine months to, to go through, um, you know, d- design and development where mm-hmm. at Grana, you know, just knowing from firsthand, it's actually very, very quick. So, you know, our team, our designers come up with a design. We send them to our, our mill and garment maker, which is vertically integrated. Right. For example, talking about our, our silk products, uh, we, we work directly with a, a mill and a garment maker in, in Huzhou. So we can come up with a design. They can send back the samples very quickly. We approve them. And then it's really about four weeks to, to make. You know, the advantages of us having a direct relationship with the fabric mm. mill and garment maker makes it very, very quick. Uh, and, and also we've been working with them for over two years now. So we've got very, very fast replenishment times. So I think our speed is very quick to get products developed into our warehouse and then obviously it's you know one to do that two day shipping but i think the biggest advantage that we have is that we're very very data driven so you know any new product that we launch will always do very very limited colors Mm. and limited numbers Um, and if we sell well we'll see that very quickly right 
Um, and then if it's doing well, then obviously we have a, a chase order and then we, we, we put that product in one of our timeless uh, collections, t- timeless products. But if it's not doing well, then we'll just sell out and we'll leave it. Uh, yeah. But that's also, I think, you know, a lot of people say that Grana is always out of stock and that's true and we're working on that. But it's also a good thing because sure. uh, we're keeping a really lean inventory base. That's right. So whenever something comes out of stock, I like it. Yeah. It's like, okay, good, that's proven. Let's get another order in and let's, you know, beef up the quantities of that. So I think that's also how we're, we're thinking of where, you know, just not knowing how other fashion brands operate, but I can imagine that their lead times will be long. Yes. Uh, they send, you know, product to, to all these shops. If it doesn't sell in the shop, then they really have to discount it. Mm-hmm. So, so we're really trying to come up with a lean, lean inventory uh, base model. Yeah, I think that's, that is your competitive advantage because like you said, it's, uh, it, from a consumer perspective, if, if something's hot and off the shelf, then then you're frustrated because you want that product. But from the other side where you're running the business, that's proof of concept. That's market feedback. That's like, okay, what we're creating is actually valuable to our target, our, our niche, right? What would you say is your target consumer? What's the ideal? What's the avatar? Like who... What specific type of person will buy Granite's products? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good good question. I mean, we we say we're we're creating you know timeless essentials. Um, so you know, someone you know, fifteen in Sydney up to a you know seventy year old in, in New York can always wear Grana, and that's you know the, the brand we're trying to create. However, we, we do have two archetypes. So we have archetypes that are about you know twenty five to thirty five, and uh, you know that they live in an urban city. They have a mindset of you know buying direct to consumer brands. Uh, they can afford luxury, mm-hmm. but they realize in today's day and age, you don't need to go and you know spend, you know, pay eight times the markup. You can go to a new direct-to-consumer brand and and get very high quality at a, at a fair and transparent price. Right. So that's trying to try, trying to find the mindset uh, that we're tapping into. Got you. And w- if there was one or two competi- competing brands that parallel closely to Grana's, you know, image look, you know, what would they be? Would they be like a J Crew or would they be like a, I don't know, uh, you know, what, is there any that you guys see yourself as competitors with? Yeah, I mean, de- definitely. I think we've chosen an industry that's that's very uh, big industry, uh, but it's also very competitive. Mm. So the way we look at, you know, potential competitors is, you know, offline and online. And I think, you know, brands that, that you know, Grana, you know, you know, we would see as competitors would be like the J Crews or the Club Monaco's where, yeah. you know, even the cause and, and theory where, you know, we're providing that, you know, quality, but obviously the, the price point is, you know, of Grana is much, much lower. And then, I mean, there's a lot of new direct-to-consumer brands, especially in, in the US that are, that are doing very well. Mm. But, you know, we really see other direct-to-consumer e-commerce brands as, as a very good thing. Um, and it's more education, education to the, you know, the global market about, you know, you don't need to go to a shop. Right. And, and try products on and, you know, buy from the shop. You can actually, you know, buy f- through the internet mm-hmm. and literally pay half the price. Right. Um, so, so we think that, you know, direct-to-consumer e-commerce brands is a, is a good thing for the whole industry. I absolutely agree. I mean, I think it's funny. I read an article just this past week about someone had written up their experience buying a Tesla online. And literally, it was just click, 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 yeah. colors, interior, and then done. And then it gets sh- not, not shipped to you. I guess you just go pick it up from a... Um, so it, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is this is basically the future. I mean, this is how uh, you know consumers are going to 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 shop uh, going forward. Um, and you've you've done a very good job of 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 positioning Grana, and I, I think that um, and you know obviously it's it's become, it's been very successful for you. You mentioned when we were walking in and and talking a bit earlier um, about your your pop ups that you have. Uh, from time to time, and you you said that you've had a bunch globally. Actually, what was the rationale behind that? How has that actually helped your brand? Considering that you are just an online direct to consumer type brand. Yeah, um, it, it's also a, a, a good question. We um, when we first started, we we said you know we're going to be online only, and that was always the plan. But then we realized that we needed to get the word out there, um, and we did a pop up in Hong Kong and. Uh, Actually, we did it on a Saturday and a Sunday, and we we, we did you know, twelve thousand US per day, um, and uh, it was just a really good introduction f- for the brand to Hong Kong. And but from then on, we you know we we still very much see Grana as um, an online e-commerce brand with the support of offline pop-ups. So mm. over the past two years, we've we've done ten pop-ups in in actually four countries. 
So we've got a little pop-up team and they're always, you know, nice. scouting locations and keeping it very lean and nimble, but, you know, going to a new market and setting up a pop-up. But the idea is, is fantastic because we do always do a launch party and then mm -hmm. we do, you know, one event every week. So we're really building community. Uh, and then actually when we leave, so we only do like a pop-up, say one to two months, but when we leave, we, you know, the sales in that country just continue to grow. Same thing that happened in Singapore and, and Australia. And mm -hmm. what happens is that, you know, those core customers act as our advocates right. that, that share Grana with their family and friends. And they, they are a little bit expensive to set up. Um, and, you know, they are, they're they breaking even on, on a store level. But the idea is really to, to, to create more awareness sure. uh, about, about uh, Yeah, I love the scarcity uh, value of a pop-up because you see it happen all the time, like, in and out Burger will have a pop-up in Hong Kong and it'll sell out within hours, you know? And, uh, and it's just, it's such a great way of, of marketing if you can do it properly. And it sounds like you, you are. So tell us about your customer base now. Where are most of your online shoppers coming from? And uh, where, what are some markets that you hope to penetrate in the future? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we see ourselves very much as a global brand. You know, we have, you know, about 70 team members here in, in Hong Kong. We, we do a lot of things in-house. We have about 25 nationalities, so very much a global team. Uh, we're sourcing global, so we have about 10, you know, origins of fabrics, and we're shipping global. So right now we're shipping to 12 markets, uh, but actually over the next few months we're going to be opening up shipping to more markets. But still our, our, our focus up until now has been on four markets. So it's definitely in Hong Kong, which mm -hmm. is our, our home market, mm -hmm. uh, Australia, Singapore and, and the US. Uh, so these have been you know, our, our main markets right. where the majority of our sales and, and customers are coming from. Um, and, and we do love the fact that we can ship globally and, and sales are just organically growing every month from right. these new markets. Um, but uh, you know, we have the mentality of you know, uh, th thinking global, but also you know, to, to create more awareness, we need to be acting more local. So, you know, we've done these local pop-ups mm -hmm. in Sing Singapore and Australia. Uh, you know, right now we're, we're developing a small U.S. team to, to do more, you know, local pop-ups right. in, in the U.S. Uh, but we still love the fact that, you know, we're, we have our centralized team and warehouse in Hong Kong, right. uh, keeping it really lean. So what were some of the, if you don't mind sharing, what were some of the challenges that you faced uh, when you decided to move to Hong Kong? Because one of the... One of the big themes uh, that in, in the startup ecosystem here is is how difficult it is to start a company in Hong Kong, despite all the benefits it has as a, you know, location-wise uh, within sort of center, central within Asia. Logistically, it's superb, uh, one of the best in the world. Tax-wise, it's very good. It's easy to set up logistically and just doing all the the paperwork and stuff, it's very easy to set up a business, but the costs are just so high. Uh, so that's one of the biggest complaints about for startups is, you know, I'd love to set up a business in Hong Kong. I just can't afford rent anywhere. So, uh, you know, and you guys have a, a beautiful space here. One of the largest spaces I've seen uh, personally in Hong Kong. And so what, what were some of the challenges that you faced, Luke, when you decided to move up here? And uh, and were there any points where you're like, oh, no, I've made the wrong decision. Maybe I should move back to Australia or, or a different place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, mo most you know, people who are starting a business always that that first round of capital is, is always the, the hardest. So I remember I, I moved over to Hong Kong and basically I just had the business plan. I ordered a couple couple of thousand uh, t-shirts but I, but I did have 200,000 and, and I, I needed to obviously make that last as, as long as possible mm -hmm. um, so I, I basically got, got to the point where I'd spent a lot of that just in setting up and, and you know getting the website where it needed to go and you know getting the products here um, setting up the warehouse mm -hmm. and setting up the initial systems uh, but then what, what I was struggling with was you know raising that first round of capital and I was going around talking to potential investors mm -hmm. and trying to raise capital but you know we hadn't launched yet and we didn't really have a product right um, so that was a really big challenge and, and what was happening is that my money was uh, running out so I was you know sort of spent a lot of my money and I was you know starting to, to have to get credit cards just to continue going so I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know other people have been in that situation. It's really quite difficult. Yeah. Um, but then I think what we we did do well was, 
you know, meeting potential investors and saying, hey, you know, we, we haven't launched yet, but, you know, if we can launch and if we can sell 2,000 T-shirts, um, you know, through, through a, what we call a beta launch, you know, will you invest in the business? And, and putting that on them, you know, a lot of them would say, yeah, if you can actually do that, right. then we'll consider it. Right. Um, so that's what we did. So, so we went through a beta launch, um, sold out the, the, of the T-shirts and then went back to them and said, hey, you know, we've just sold out yeah. the T-shirts. We've got a proof point. Mm-hmm. People are loving the product. The price point's obviously great. Uh, we've proven that we can use Hong Kong as a hub and ship to eight markets. Um, so then, then obviously raising that first first round of capital was was a lifesaver. Right. Um, and I think that was very much a, a, a big challenge. Um, That's awesome. A, a really good learning too. That's a great story. It's it's almost like it's almost like a Kickstarter type thing where you're like go to your investors and you're like okay we don't have anything out there yet but. <laughs> If we do our success here, so sort to of try yeah. and get that commitment, yeah, up that's front. that's a great uh, strategy you used actually. Um, so I think that's 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 definitely a good takeaway for for the listeners. So speaking of funding, you guys did a pretty nice round last year uh, with Alibaba, right? It, was it um, with Cindy, right? So yep. uh, congratulations on that. Um, how now? That's basically put you on another level of startup track i mean you know i think when you start getting to you're 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 starting to play with the big boys which is great what do you envision uh your growth to be like with that last round of funding Uh, what are your goals sort of for 2017 and in the next you know 18 months so to speak yeah i mean that 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 funding was 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 awesome for for the business it was um yeah a, a series a round and we got a, a mix of, uh, of equity from from Alibaba and other investors, and also venture debt. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was it was fantastic, and really you know, was able a, enabled the business to to hire some some key people, um, especially on on the product side and on the fulfillment side and on the tech side. So I think we've really strengthened the team to make mm-hmm. us much more scalable. Uh, allowed us to move into this space here, and obviously having a, a bigger warehouse that allows us to to really. Um, you know, order more inventory and, and have more um, potential growth. Uh, but then also, you know, just, you know, continue growing sales. I mean, we're in the stage now that, you know, we're, we're selling out of stock so quickly. So to be able to, you know, reorder stock um, to, to continue growing our sales at our, our pace is, is great. Um, you know, on average, we've been growing sales at, you know, about 15% every month. Um, so it, it's just, it's just allowed us to do that. And, you know, now what, what, we, what we're doing is, uh, we're really strengthening the categories that that are working for Grana, so mm-hmm. the, the the Chinese silk, Peruvian Pima, Mongolian cashmere, uh, but then also look at new categories such as outerwear, um, you know, activewear. We we already you know did our first you know launch of that, and we got a lot of great feedback. We've got a you know new new products coming out soon. Um, so so looking at new potential categories, but also new markets. Right. Um, you know, I think US is is definitely a great market for Grana. Uh, we, you know, we have one to two day shipping. It's tax free, customs free. So, you know, from a back end logistics point of view, it's it's uh, it's it's a great market for mm-hmm. us. And also, I think you know our products speak very well to the U.S. market. Right. So that's you know been growing at a f- tremendous rate every month. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it allows us to to set up a local marketing team uh, in the U.S. Uh, but then also obviously having Alibaba on board is um, you know, helping us with China as well. Right. So we're super excited about China. Um, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. What, what, how do you see that uh, playing out? Obviously, China is one of the most difficult markets to crack for, especially for Definitely. foreigners. So having having them alongside of you as a strategic partner is is fabulous because I think <laughs> if you're going to partner with anyone in China, I mean, they're yeah. the guys to, to be uh, next Absolutely. With, so know. so we've seen that, you know, the, the two biggest e-commerce markets in the world are, is US and, mm-hmm. and China. So so China, we, we're definitely going in, uh, but we're entering pretty soon, actually. We're already shipping some boxes now, but, um, but nice. next couple of months we'll be open on Tmall. Um, so it's very much a soft launch. And uh, like you said, you know, we've got a lot to learn in China. Uh, we want to ship boxes. We want to get feedback, get feedback on the value proposition of the brand, um, how the how the product is perceived in China. Um, so, you know, this year is more about testing, a lot of small tests. And we've got a bunch of assumptions that we're, we're getting feedback on. Uh, but then hopefully we can sort of uh, build out our, our strategic plan and really give China a, a big focus next year. Uh, but you know, in saying that, we've we've now got on board a China country manager, and we're we're, we're building a very small team in Shanghai, and uh, in, you know, working closely with Alibaba and Tmall on 
on, uh, on, on developing sales. So it's really exciting, exciting times. That's awesome. Last couple of questions, Luke. Uh, and again, thanks for, for your time and, and showing me around the, the warehouse and, and the showroom. It's, it's, been, it's been awesome. The first of the last three questions, let's say. Um, where do you see Grana in five to 10 years? You know, I mean, uh, this is a question that I like to ask a lot of startup founders and, you know, the, <laughs> the sort of politically correct conservative answer I always get a lot of times is, oh, I just want to focus on my product and the customer and, and which is great. And I, I appreciate that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I like to ask founders, do you want to grow this company and IPO it? You know, is that, or do you want, are you okay with exiting earlier than a public offering? Or do you want to just run it private and, and just grow it? I mean, this company has your last name on it. So it, this is very personal to you as well. Um, so Luke, how do you see this playing out? If everything, if all the stars align and you keep this trajectory, which is, is you're doing incredible, how, where does Grana stand in, in 10 years from now? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I love the fact that, you know, we've got a brand that, that we own, that, you know, we, we still have, you know, majority control over the company and we can make, you know, strategic decisions. Uh, and I really, really, you know, w would hate to ever sell out. Uh, I don't, that's definitely not the plan. Um, you know, I, 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 I think we can, you know, grow the business into a, into a large e-commerce brand. Um, I think it's such an exciting time, especially just with, you know, our new business model and just being able to really drive that over the next five to 10 years and, you know, seeing where the, where the brand en ends up. But, you know, I, I feel very positive about the brand. I think we're building in the pillars to make it a you know, global brand. And, uh, you know, I think definitely in, in 10 years time, I still, you know, seeing Grana continue to grow and open up to new markets and add, add more products to the range. And, you know, strategically being in, in Hong Kong allows us to ship to a lot of markets. Um, you know, one of the brands that we look at that we think is doing awesome is, is ASOS. Mm -hmm. You know, they're shipping to 240 markets now. And, you know, I think that that's our vision, you know, right. one day, hope, hopefully to, to be able to, to be shipping to all these markets. And, uh, you know, IPO, I mean, that, that's definitely way, way, way off. Uh, but I think that the plan, especially with the team, is, is not to, to sell out and, you know, be our own brand. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also like, you know, we, we've got to really manage the growth. Right. And I think now what we're really focused on is ROI on everything that we do. Right. Uh, we've only got a limited amount of capital. And we've just got to make sure that we, you know, we, we use that to the best that we can, mm -hmm. um, you know, keep a control over the costs. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've got a good amount of funding now, but, you know, now our, our attention's more turning towards like cutting costs and optimizing and getting to break even on a cash flow level. Uh, and that's you know we're aiming for that next year, but it's also a fine tune of of growing because we're growing pretty quickly now. So, so the next couple of years is really important for the brand. But but long term, you know, I, I do see Grana as uh, hopefully being a big brand and and adding value and mm -hmm. um, you know awesome. really shaking up the industry. Great answer. Uh, <laughs> I I think that your investors will like to hear about your that that last piece about you know your ROI and 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 whatnot. Uh, it's always nice to hear. Uh, startup founders that are are also concerned about the the money that they've taken in. Um, so as an investor myself, I I, I often uh, ask that question as well. Okay, um, so I want to ask for one last piece of parting advice that you can give to aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, maybe based in Hong Kong. Hong Kong obviously is a big fashion type city. A lot of people uh, love this this se segment. Um, Let's say someone's trying to start off and follow in your footsteps, Luke. What what piece of advice could you give them? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, Grana, we're still pretty young, so we're you know still trying to prove ourselves. So I'm not sure if I'm, I can talk from that much authority, but you know, a couple of things that I've picked up along the way that I, that I I really believe in. I think the first one is um, you know staying true to the original vision. And I, I know you know there's a lot of talk about you know the lean startup and, mm -hmm. and pivoting a lot. Um, and I do believe in that, but, you know, I think, you know, w when I thought of the idea for Grana, there was a really strong idea for the brand of, you know, world's best fabrics, timeless essentials at, at great prices. Right. And I think along the way, you know, investors or, uh, you know, people that I meet always challenge that and they say, oh, why don't you put up the prices or why don't you become more fashionable? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, one of the, the lessons that I got was, you know, stay true to the original idea. 
um, rather than trying to pivot too much and because then what happens it's you know the, the idea that you originally had gets manipulated a lot so I'm, I'm not saying that don't be flexible but I'm you know I'm saying that you know what has worked well for Grano is staying true to what we really believe right I think that's the first one and I think the second one is you know startups are always hard yeah. you know there's been some really tough times on, yeah. on cash flow on team on value proposition but I think you know for me it's just always persevering just you know always having that can do attitude mm -hmm. um so that's also a big big lesson for me great thank you for those last two pieces of pioneering advice i think our listeners are going to get a lot out of it and uh, thank you for your time I, I really appreciate it i know how busy you are and it's just been so nice to come here and uh sit down with you and and of course you know i'm a big so ch champion advocate of hong kong startups so i love seeing uh s seeing you guys do, do well and uh, continue to grow so we'll definitely have our keep our eye on you and uh and i'm sure the audience will as well um last question is really where can people find you follow you connect with you i know amanda's probably the the gatekeeper here but uh um what's the best place other than i mean grana.com obviously um so are you on social media yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been great to have this talk and, you know, thank you also for the time. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm on, always on LinkedIn, always open mm -hmm. to, to receiving connections. So just, you know, LinkedIn, Luke Rana. Uh, also Instagram, you know, follow me on Instagram. Oh, yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Luke Rana. Um, but also just go to the website. Yeah. Grana.com. Just check it out. You know, we, we, we love feedback. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have a, um, a program called Grana Labs where we have 3,000 3, 3, members and we always get, you know, different feedback on products or, or marketing. Um, so, you know, check it out, sign up to labs, you know, send an email in and it, it'll, it'll sure get to me. But, um, but uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks again for your time. Such a pleasure, Luke, to sit down with you and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. All the show notes and links can be found over at jkimshow.com. Come back often and make sure you subscribe, rate, and review. Don't forget to join us next week for another exciting episode of The J. Kim Show. I'd love to hear your comments. You can find me on Twitter at jkimmer, J-A-Y-K-I-M-M-E-R. See you guys next week. This podcast is brought to you by Hack Your Fitness, the high achiever's guide to getting ripped in under three hours a week. If you're anything like me, you're probably working a full-time job or jobs and trying to find time to balance family life, social life, and last but not least, fitness. Look, I get it. I'm a full-time investor and entrepreneur myself and father of two. So how am I able to stay fit year-round without spending hours and hours in the gym killing myself on the cardio machine? After struggling for the last 15 years trying every workout and diet under the sun, I finally designed a system that allows me to achieve and maintain single-digit body fat for life in under 3 hours a week. Cardio not required. Head on over to hackyour.fitness and download my free 13-page guide that teaches you the simple science behind efficient fitness and smart nutrition and gives you everything you need to know to finally take control of your life. That's hackyour.fitness.